tonight would agree with me. As we look out into our society and we find a society which is sadly in darkness, there seems to be a darkness which is coming into our land as we're aborting our children, killing the elderly. We need to look no further than ourselves because God has placed in our hands a mission and a gift, and it is a gift to be his sons, and his son is the one who is the light of the world. We are his hands and his feet, and if our society is going dark, it is because we are not out there lighting it up. So as we listen to the words of this wonderful bishop this evening, I ask you to consider in your heart the question of religious liberty. And when it came, when the attack came, were we standing there shining the light of Christ or were we hiding in our homes as Catholics? And to our Protestant brothers and sisters, we welcome you here tonight. You're going to receive one thing, and that is the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith. We're not ashamed of that. Our doors are always open to you, but we will always tell you the truth, the truth of our faith. Our speaker this evening was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and entered seminary for the Maryland province of the Society of Jesus. He was ordained to the priesthood on June 1st, 1974, one year and one month before I was born. <laughs> His education includes a master's degree in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame, a master of divinity from the Weston School of Theology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and a doctorate in moral theology from the Gregorian University in Rome with a specializ specialization in fundamental moral theology and bioethics. He taught philosophy at Loyola College, St. Joseph University, Boston College, the University of Notre Dame, and St. Mary's College. On July 6th, 1999, Pope John Paul II appointed him the ninth Bishop of Helena, and on 2003, August 1st, 2003, he was installed as Bishop of Madison. To me, more important than that is that our speaker this evening is a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, and he truly is an example to us, shining the light of Christ in the darkness of our society. Please join me in welcoming Bishop Robert Morlino. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us say together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Our Lady assumed into heaven, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. It's great to be here, great to be here. I hope that I shine the light into the darkness, but whatever I shine, it's certainly big. <laughs> <laughs> so the Lord has taken care of that uh, according to the natural law. <laughs> and we'll, we'll get back to that let me just put a few words here that'll keep me focused. Modernity, conscience, Freedom of religion. <coughs> 
state imposed secularism and its results, the results of state imposed secularism. Here we want to talk about artificial contraception. Same sex unions. Gender identity. that's all written down there, I can free myself of this, by and large, which is why that's written down there. <laughs> now, the Council of Trent and Vatican I. Now, we all have to get real nervous when we hear Vatican I, because that's pre-Vatican II. <laughs> so the very thought of Vatican I should cause one to tremble at the innermost depths. Something so pre-Vatican II as pre-Vatican I, as Vatican I. Uh, Council of Trent, Vatican I and Vatican II are all the church's responses to modernity down through history, beginning with the Reformation. Response to modernity down through history, beginning with the Reformation. Now, what does modernity boil down to? It's a wide term. And this evening I'm going to have to admittedly oversimplify some things. Otherwise, we'd be here indefinitely. And the Lord has a beautiful weekend in store <laughs> for all of you. And there's other things like golf, beautiful liturgies and such. Next weekend, the Middle East Festival. I wish I could stay around that long. <laughs> I eat well everywhere, but I really eat well in the Middle East. <laughs> Somebody once said to me, I wonder if there are really good restaurants, this is someone who had never traveled, really good restaurants in Jerusalem. I said, when you're ready, call me. <laughs> I'll tell you them all. When I studied in Rome, it was kind of a joke among my fellow students, my priest classmates, that uh, if someone wanted a tour of artwork and churches and so on, there were a group of people who were very capable of doing that. But if someone wanted a list of the best restaurants, <laughs> no one was my equal. <laughs> and with the Lord's help and goodness, I've tried to witness that. <laughs> right now, even as we speak, there are several crabs swimming 
beneath this beautiful cross. All right. Modernity refers to a major turn in the way human beings thought about knowing. The whole tradition of Aristotle and Thomas was that to know the truth meant that there was a correspondence between the mind, the human mind, and the reality out there. There was a conformity of the mind to what was real, independent of the mind. That only makes sense. I mean, when we talk about this group gathered here tonight, what modernity tried to do was create doubt in me that you're actually here. Make me wonder whether this is a figment of my imagination. Now, how silly that is. If I go over here and I keep walking, I don't stop, I'm going to spill wine on myself and I'm going to hurt somebody. Things will, it's common sense. <coughs> Things that I know as real are real. If I come over and start swinging my arms right over here with this gentleman, my friend, or if I start swinging this cane <laughs> and say, there's really no one here, this is all in my mind, what would happen to these poor people? <laughs> I mean, talk about common sense. Common sense is common sense. But modernity, Descartes, Kant, all those types, took the turn that the most real thing was the thinking thing, <coughs> the I who thinks. And instead of my mind being conformed to reality independent of the mind, it was decided that there was no reality independent of the mind. There was none. There were me and my ideas strolling down the avenue. Not my shadow, but my ideas. Now, when you get the knowing, thinking I locked in to a world with my own ideas, when I see this group, I don't see the group. I see my idea of the group. Was well, there a group there apart from my idea of it? Who knows? See how silly that is? Whence comes the question, poorly phrased, if a tree falls in an isolated portion of the forest, does anyone hear it? It makes noise, whether anyone hears it or not. But see, the very idea that there could be a tree out there making noise all by itself without somehow being subject to the almighty I, capital I, that idea was completely repugnant. This is egocentric. This is egotistical. 
This is worship of the evil ego. This is self-deification. I and my mind create my world. And then what? I have control over it. So I'm in control. Instead of being accountable to what is independent of the mind, I am in control of everything. And the world is what I think it is. So you have your ideas of the world, I have my ideas of the world. So every human being is isolated with his or her own ideas of the world. There's isolation in this egocentrism. And then people say, we want love. Love is a union of minds and hearts. Union of minds and hearts in what? The truth. But aha, there is no truth. If there's no truth, there's no love. And there isn't any love. The world is merciless. The world is merciless. That's modernity. The isolated self creating his or her own world in such wise that union of minds and hearts are impossible because union of minds and hearts is union in the truth and there is no truth. Everybody has his or her own little world locked in with his or her own little truth. And we see that all the time. I mean, teaching college one day a good number of years ago, I was having trouble communicating a logical argument in words to a student. So I said, do you have some basic understanding of math? And he said, yeah. So I wrote out the argument in words and I transposed it into symbolic logic. I said, now do you see that mathematically certainty is transferred from the premises to the conclusion? Do you see that up here? Do you know what he said to me? Looking at this mathematical symbolic logic piece of information. He said, that's how you feel. <laughs> and I said, I looked at that equation and I said, if that's how I feel, I'll eat both my hats. Because that's not a feeling. <laughs> But if I think that it's a feeling, it's a feeling. If I feel that it's a feeling, it's a feeling. And that's why the mass media constantly, you know, when your grandmother was brutally murdered on the way home from the store and you happen to open the window and see this happening to her, how did you feel? What? If they're so stupid that they don't know the answer to that, they shouldn't be on television. <laughs> and the media will play it up if someone, they love it if someone breaks down into tears. Oh, President Bush got teary-eyed when he dedicated his library. That was real. He was real. 
and they're just waiting to see Hillary shed a tear. <laughs> so that they can have an out-of-body experience. <laughs> but it's all as they think it is. It's all as they feel it is. That's modernity. Me and my ideas strolling down the avenue, my world, my values, I'll accept your morals, you accept mine, all of that stuff. That's modernity. Relativism, skepticism, nihilism. Nihilism meaning in the end, not only isn't there truth, but there isn't meaning either. And we're going to see that as we go along. Anything can mean anything. How do you get love? What do we hear on the TV? Buy a Subaru. <laughs> it comes from love. See, that is completely meaningless. And yet we sit there day after day and listen to that, and if we don't think carefully, we get used to that kind of meaninglessness. We get desensitized to meaninglessness, and then anybody can say anything about anything. Enter politicians. <laughs> this is a field day. Words don't mean things anymore. It's a field day. You know, promises are made. It's never what I, that's not what I said. I never meant that. And on and on and on. There's no accountability to the truth. That's modernity. And when accountability to the truth is lost, there is no love possible. The world without meaning is one in which people keep dialoguing, knowing that it's meaningless. <laughs> Why do they keep dial dialoguing? Because the alternative is that they'll kill each other. And if they just keep talking, they won't do any harm. And so we have it in the church. You know, the bishops dialoguing with certain sisters. It goes nowhere. <laughs> but those dialogues are proclaimed a success because we're still in dialogue. <laughs> Dialogue is not a means to an end. It's an end in itself. Why? Because nothing means anything anymore. And if we keep dialoguing, we're more likely not to harm one another. That's a very low degree of civilization indeed. That's modernity. Do you have a pretty good picture now of modernity? <laughs> Okay, so I can go on. Now, in the Second Vatican Council, in Dignitatis Humanae, the Second Vatican Council formulated a response to modernity. It didn't say in that paragraph that that's what it was doing, but that's what it did. Let me read you the response to modernity. Deep within his conscience, man discovers a law which he has not laid upon himself. See? Things 
This is modernity. <laughs> Things are falling apart. <laughs> Even as I speak, I'm being overcome by modernity. <laughs> Deep within his conscience, man discovers a law which he has not laid upon himself. But this is Gaudium et Spes. This is the document that we're told is ultra-liberal. Deep within his conscience, man discovers a law which he has not laid upon himself, but which he must obey. Vatican II, obey. Imagine that. <laughs> but which he must obey, its, vo its voice ever calling him to love and to do what is good, and to avoid evil. That voice sounds in his heart at the right moment, for man has in his heart a law inscribed by God. His conscience is most, man's most secret core and his sanctuary. There he is alone with God, whose voice echoes in his depths. is there in that sacred sanctuary of conscience? People said Vatican II taught that it was the I. The I who can control all of his or her ideas, that I, and who therefore can control the conscience. It's funny. I did that because I followed my conscience. And whenever I follow my conscience, I happen to do exactly what I wanted to do in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> That's what modernity did to the notion of conscience. It's the isolated self gritting teeth, closing the eyes, and saying, what best is me, me, me? It's all about me. God is there in the sacred sanctuary of conscience, and since he's there, <laughs> he is the major player there, I am not. And God has inscribed on the heart of the human being a law. It's inscribed in the very nature of man the natural law, which boils down to the Ten Commandments. So when I enter the sacred sanctuary of conscience, I do not become supreme over all theories of right and wrong. I do not become supreme against every teaching of religious authority. The conscience is not a dispensation machine <laughs> from doing what is basically right. It's not a free pass. It's not a get out of jail free card. That's how it's used. The minute somebody tells me, even today, as a priest or a bishop, I followed my conscience, in my mind immediately I say, well, what did you do that was wrong? <laughs> <laughs> that you're seeking to justify. <coughs> Let me see if I can use a little of my training to pull that out of you. 
that sanctuary of conscience is inhabited in the first place, Vatican II, by God, who wrote the natural law on the heart of man, Ten Commandments. And what is that natural law? It's the law that can be derived from reason alone. The Ten Commandments can all be derived from reason alone, beginning with the existence of God. We don't think so much about this. The existence of God can be known by reason alone. It's not necessary for any human being to say, I have to believe that God exists. There's nothing wrong with believing God exists. Matter of fact, it's good. And many people do not have the wherewithal to go through the reasoning process to see how reason alone determines that God exists. Not everybody has to do that, but it can be done. And it can be done by every human being of goodwill. The natural law is not for Catholics. Catholics observe the natural law because it is true. Catholics do not observe the natural law because it is Catholic. They observe it because it is true. And we have to be very careful, and I'll say some more about this. We have to be very careful nowadays of allowing others to turn the prohibition of artificial contraception into a Catholic denominational belief. Most Catholics, I'm afraid, believe that one believes that artificial contraception is wrong in the same way that one believes that Jesus Christ is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity under the signs of bread and wine. Transubstantiation, abortion is wrong. Those are Catholic things. And so we're going to make that point by claiming our freedom of religion as Catholics. I have to say that gives away the whole point of the natural law. I want strongly to uphold freedom of religion. Nobody wants to do that more than I do when I'm doing it. But not at the expense of failing to see that the natural law is in the first place the law of human nature. In the first place it's not a Catholic thing and it binds all rational creatures. Just because they are rational, regardless of whether they are Catholic. The natural law is for everybody, it's not for Catholics. So we have to be careful when we say our religious freedom causes us to defend the church's teaching on artificial contraception. The church's teaching on artificial contraception simply confirms the natural law, which every human being can know by reason alone. Artificial contraception. The natural law teaches us that God exists. Why is the Catholic Church so obsessed with sex? <laughs> Only because the culture is so obsessed with sex. 
And sexual union happens to be that space which God created for the couple, but first of all for himself as a place where he can bring forth new life. <coughs> the sacred space of sexual communion belongs to God first and to the couple second. God created that space for himself. Practicing artificial contraception tells God to get out of that space. God is not the owner of that space. We are and we'll do what we want. How can we do that? We follow our conscience. <laughs> God ain't there. Any conscience that's followed where God ain't there to be obeyed is not what the church teaches about conscience. The human person enters that sanctuary where God is present, where he has written the natural law on people's minds and hearts, and where God is to be obeyed. Conscience cannot be used the way modernity uses it to completely emancipate human beings from any external authority whatsoever. Conscience, in order to be such an emancipation, would have to be God. Conscience is a creature. It's a created faculty. So that the human being in God's presence, aware of the natural law can make good decisions. We now have people dispensing themselves from every natural law there is, one after another, almost in order. And they're doing it in the name of conscience so that God and the natural law are obviously excluded. So the misinterpretation of Vatican II, that conscience is the supreme law, that's the way they usually put it. Conscience is the supreme law. Conscience is the supreme law when it's truly conscience where God and the natural law are there. You can't have conscience without the natural law. What sense does it make to say that conscience dispenses people from the natural law? Conscience is the natural law. Take away the natural law, there's no conscience. It's just I, 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 I. To which sensible people ought to say, ay, 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 ay. <laughs> so, the natural law can be known by reason alone. Conscience is a place, that inner sanctuary, where man is alone with God and with God's law. So to use conscience to dispense from God's law just doesn't make sense. Conscience is formed by the natural law. It doesn't have power over the natural law. The natural law holds conscience accountable because God is there and the natural law comes from God whose existence we can know by reason alone. How are we doing? Are you doing all right? Yeah. All right. And I, even, I haven't even needed a snack yet. <laughs> now. now. It really is sad, isn't it, this situation? But, um, now,
the existence of God can be known by reason alone. And since the existence of God can be known by reason alone, the human relationship with God and the freedom that that entails, the freedom of religion, is by far the most important freedom. Because as goes my relationship with God, goes my eternal salvation. People never talk anymore as though it's possible to lose one's salvation. Why? Because I follow my conscience, that is, I follow my I, and my I is always right by definition. No God, no natural law. But conscience is accountable to God and the natural law. The natural law frees me, doesn't enslave me. It frees me to seek the truth about God and to seek my salvation. Nothing could be more important than the freedom to carry out what is necessary to be saved. Once we know that God exists, we got to worry about being saved. No freedom could be more sacred than the freedom to do what I have to do to be saved, because without that freedom, I don't lose something in time, I lose something in eternity. Nobody has a right to block or interfere with my relationship with God. Nobody ever has a right to stop me from doing what is necessary to be saved. No one has that right. Not even Mrs. Sibelius. <laughs> Nobody has that right. <coughs> Freedom of religion is the most basic of all the human rights because the other rights are limited to matters of time. Freedom of religion relates to my eternal salvation. Whether I'm free to achieve that by God's grace or whether I'm not. There couldn't be anything more important than that. It amazes me how it's been hard. At first, it seemed easy to sell Catholics on the importance of freedom of religion. We seem to be building some momentum. And in just a year, where has that momentum gone? It's proving very hard to get Catholics interested in freedom of religion. It's very bad. Because that means that Catholics are sitting by worrying about other things. They're worried about all sorts of other things, <coughs> depending on where the mass media turns their attention. They're worried about, instead of freedom of religion, they're worried about the freedom of the boys to use the little girls' room. <coughs> because that's where the media are taking us. That's the distraction. That's the distraction. The media is in cahoots, and this is no news to anybody, 
with the administration <coughs> to force state-imposed secularism on everyone as our religion. Vatican II said, freedom from religion means freedom from coercion by the state to practice a religion or freedom from coercion by the state not to practice a religion. Religious freedom is freedom from the state in religious matters. That's Vatican II. That's not what we have. We have secularism being imposed by the administration and the, admi and the mass media across every conceivable line. Now, you know, it's the common core. See, let's try to get a hold of education. Now it's what colleges are going to observe new regulations so that they can be more affordable. And only if they do that will they get the money. And of course, when the money comes, all sorts of strings will be attached. State-imposed secularism rests on the misinterpretation of Vatican II about conf uh, conscience, and it rests on the suppression of freedom of religion. If we lock ourselves in church and don't let anybody outside hear us, that's our freedom of worship. Big deal. <laughs> Jesus Christ said, go out into the whole world and tell the good news. He didn't say, stay in church and when you go out, keep your mouth shut. We Catholics have to stop keeping our mouth shut. We really have to stop that. That's been our way. We say, I'm not going to go out and preach on a soapbox. Okay, leave out the soapbox. <laughs> but go out and preach on the floor. You don't need the soapbox. <laughs> on the sidewalk. We have to speak up. Because we are being steamrollered into an impossible situation. The state imposed secularism, which destroys conscience, which is, a all out, is an all out attack on the natural law. Secularism destroys conscience rejects the natural law explicitly. There's not even an attempt to cover up anymore. Yeah, I read something now that if members of the military want to enter into a same-sex union, they get special bonuses and benefits. Heterosexuals don't get that. The Pentagon. I used to like the Pentagon. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, anyway, let's look at the results. The results of the destruction of conscience and the all-out attack on the natural law are the promotion of artificial contraception, not only by the Health and Human Services mandate, but by every other means that can be found. There are legislatures around the country arguing that the morning after pill should be given to 11-year-olds. 
see, get them young. And if the parents try to keep them from getting the morning after pill, let the 11 year old sue the parents and let the court judge that the kid won. That's where this goes. Artificial contraception, it's exalted. Make as much contraceptive material as available worldwide as is possible. It's now part of the common good. The, the church has always taught, following Thomas Aquinas, that the state can tolerate evil. The state can tolerate evil. The government cannot prohibit all evil. It's not possible. State can tolerate evil. But the church has always taught that the state may never promote evil. And the state is the principal promoter with the media of this contraceptive culture, even daring to try to divide Catholics among themselves once again over this issue. You know? The bishops say one thing, and then we get the nuns on the bus. <laughs> That must be quite the thing to be on that bus. <laughs> I keep praying that the Lord will not let me dream about that. <laughs> I might not sleep for weeks. As I was coming out of the hotel today, there was a traffic jam there caused by a huge bus. I took one look at that bus and I ran back inside. <laughs> now, artificial contraception and same-sex unions. I just told you about the latest at the Pentagon. Everything is being done to promote this yeah. as preferable to heterosexual unions. Preferable. Now we're really freeing up Americans so that everyone can have all of his or her own civil rights. God and the natural law define human nature. How could it be a civil right to go against human nature? But that's exactly what they're proposing. <clears throat> Marriage equality, they say. <clears throat> Artificial contraception. Why is the Catholic divorce rate so high? Pretty much comparable to the divorce rate of any other group. What is marriage? To which one should be committed? Marriage is the sign of the union of Christ and the church. Now, so in order to have a good sacramental marriage, couples have to believe that marriage is a sign of the union between Christ and the church. What if those married couples constantly promote artificial contraception and then say, we know what the teaching of the church is, but that's not what Jesus would want. Jesus wants me to follow my conscience. <laughs> Jesus doesn't want artificial contraception prohibited. 
The church says Jesus does. The church is wrong. How can a couple who profess by their behavior that Christ is divided from the church witness to his union with the church? They're saying, as far as contraception is concerned, Christ is not at one with the church. What Christ wants is different from what the church wants. So Christ is not one with the church. And by the way, George and I are public witnesses of the fact that Christ is one with the church. You can only live a contradiction so long. Do you get that? That's a real contradiction. On the one hand, George and I are public witnesses of the unity of Christ and the church. On the other hand, whenever the subject of artificial contraception comes up, George and I both say that what Christ wants from us is not what the church teaches. He wants something else. So whenever this topic comes up, Christ is divided from the church. We know what Christ really wants, and it's not what the church wants. On the other hand, we're public witnesses that Christ is at one with the church. <laughs> Do you see the problem? You getting that? It's almost too late at night for that, but. <laughs> Brain twisters for the evening. Here we are. <laughs> Do you get that one? I think that's why a lot of Catholic marriages are in trouble. Because as married, they proclaim Christ's union with the church. And as the individuals who follow the misinterpreted, misinterpreted notion of conscience, they proclaim regularly that Christ is separate from the church. The church does this, Christ wouldn't do that. Either Christ and the church are one or they're not. And either a married couples are witnesses to that unity or they're proclaimers of a disunity between Christ and the church. They can't have it both ways. People cannot live out internal contradictions indefinitely. At worst, you wind up, when you're that way, you wind up going to the shrink because you've lost your mind. <laughs> and at best, you get to the shrink before you lose it. <laughs> and maybe he or she can help, and maybe they can't. Gender identity. That's the biggie there, Tula two levels of this problem. First level is what I mentioned. Modernity. Is Johnny a boy or a girl? Well, Johnny is too young to know out of the womb whether he's a boy or a girl. So we're going to put that on hold until Johnny decides whether he's a boy or a girl. But if he thinks he's a boy, he's a boy. And if he thinks he's a girl, he's a girl. Johnny is one big head trip <laughs> with his gender identity. Bradley Manning thinks he's a woman, therefore he is. Let's cough up the bucks to make sure that he can try to be a woman. Taxpayer's expense. Give me a break. That's one level of it. You know, does Jill want to go into the girls' room or does she want to go into the boys' room at school to go potty? <laughs> well, she makes up her mind. If she thinks she belongs in the boys' room, she belongs in the boys' room. If she thinks she belongs in the girls' room, she belongs in the girls' room. That's modernity this isolated I. There's another level to gender identity. 
I mean no offense. My grandmother was the prime instrument of the Lord in my own vocation. And she was a thrill and a trip. <laughs> She's one of the few people I know who at 96 was still a barrel of laughs. She was funny right to the end. Women are called to be like Mary, the greatest of all Christians. That's the bottom line about what the church has to say about women. The greatest of all Christians was not any pope, not any bishop, not any priest. It was the woman, Mary, the mother of God. Women are called to be like her. That's not a bad deal. That's not a bad deal. But under the influence of the media and the administration, our society has become increasingly feminized. That is, men have become more and more accustomed to be intimidated by women. And therefore, we have all this crime. We hear it all the time. Boys don't have the male role model. The same people who say boys don't have the, main, the male role model don't want them to. <laughs> Let's have daddy and daddy and mommy and mommy or whatever we have. It's become very unfashionable to talk about men being men. It is politically incorrect to talk about men being men, as though there were no difference. I saw on TV the other day that men who seek testosterone shots actually become more feminine in the longer run so that's not the answer. There's no chemical answer. Men have to stop being afraid to be men. Men have to get together as Christian men and reflect on what it's like to be like St. Joseph and like uh, Jesus, just as women have to get together and reflect on what it's like to be Mary. Of the two, the woman, the woman is greater. There's no ambiguity about that. But men are still supposed to be men. And the idea of getting Catholic men together to reflect on their manhood is an essential ministry in the church in these days. That issue of gender identity is more important than whether Jill goes to the guy's bathroom or the girl's. <coughs> Though that's a lot of silliness. We should just stop that. The Middle East is ablaze and the country is broke. And the politicians are fighting about down this way, Sally, or that way? What do you want to do? Yeah. We're going to preserve that sacred right that you have, Sally. You can be a boy or you can be a girl. See, this has got to stop. This is a direct attack on the natural law. And it presumes the destruction of conscience. Abortion. Direct attack. How could it ever be possible? Reason alone tells us it could never be possible to intentionally kill <coughs> the innocent preborn. How can we massacre the innocents again and play Herod in our own way? Except 
massacre them by the millions instead of by the hundreds. Going against reason, going against our human nature. The administration and the media have the whole com country desensitized and comfortable with that. The whole country desensitized and comfortable. And what does this all say about the future? Well, it says lots of things, too many to go into. But if human nature loses its sense of its own identity, that means human beings don't know what it means to be human anymore. Well, then where do you go? There is no measure of humanity to which human persons are accountable. None. We make it up as we go. Actually, we don't make it up as we go. The administration makes it up as they go, and the mass media help them. We wait now on these crucial issues of what it means to be human, which side the mass media will decide to promote. Because it's a foregone conclusion that whatever they promote will win. And so far, that's been the way it is. This means writing strong letters to the editor. It means canceling subscriptions, and on and on and on. And most importantly, it means speaking out. What's happening here? We got artificial contraception. We have same-sex unions. We have abortion. What does that add up to? No children. Fewer and fewer and fewer children until there were none. While we pile up trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars to place on the shoulders of those children who will never be. What is this? Later tonight, I'm going to go out on my balcony, and I'm going to speak in a distinct voice across the Potomac and tell them how much I dislike this. <laughs> so if you see that a bishop was arrested in Arlington, if you see that a bishop was arrested in Arlington, it was not Bishop Laverty. You can be sure of that. But well, you know, Bishop Laverde is in trouble too. He got, uh, they got after him when they got after me. What were we called? It was in the National Catholic Reporter. We were called, oh, we were called the Republican bishops. <laughs> because of speaking out on the Health and Human Services, etc. And there were five of us. So it was my I was in good company. <laughs> Cardinal Dolan, Archbishop Shapu, uh, Bishop David Ricken, my neighbor to the north, Green Bay, myself, and Bishop Laverde. There were five of us. So see? I did not mean in any way to say that Bishop Laverde does not support our convictions. I didn't mean to say that in any way at all. He does. 
What I meant to say is that he wouldn't go out on his balcony in the <laughs> middle of the night <laughs> and yell things across the Potomac. That's more my personality than his. <laughs> Not all the Italians are the same. <laughs> but just think of it. Trillions and trillions and trillion do dollars of debt laid on future generations whose numbers become fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer. That's what happens when people, God forbid a nation, turn against human nature. And in the year of faith, in the spirit of the new evangelization, we got to stand up, we got to speak out, we got to write letters, we've got to vote in accord with the natural law and with Catholic teaching, but in the first place with the natural law, because we should be able to convince brothers and sisters by reason alone that they should vote in accord with the natural law too. But we've got to get into action. There is a sleeping giant, and it has to be awakened. Speaking of giants, it's kind of funny when I have mass and I have green vestments, the little kid thinks it's the jolly green giant. <laughs> and when I have purple vestments, they think it's Barney. <laughs> I kid you not. So, it's not in your hands, it's in God's hands. But with God's grace, he wants your participation. And the time is over when we can sit back and kind of say, well, maybe he'll be voted out of office in a couple of years and this will all go away. The roots are too deep. The roots are too deep, it's not gonna go away. We're going to get to the point where he is no longer the problem, but rather where others who have been programmed and indoctrinated in a certain way, they're the problems, and there'll be plenty of them left. <coughs> so if Catholics continue to sit around and do nothing, we do something of a terrible disservice to ourselves and especially a terrible disservice. You know, you as parents and myself as a spiritual father, we do terrible disservice to the sons and daughters that we love so much. So thanks for listening to me, and God love you. and inspiring and, and tremendously fun too, thank you. The question is, what is the moral correct response for a Catholic hospital when the government gets to the situation, which either by law or judicial decision it's going to get to, that because a hospital uh, delivers babies, it is by law required now to do abortions? I mean, when, when that situation is reached, what is the proper reaction of a Catholic hospital? We can't do it. But I have to, when I say that, I have to be careful because I, I, I don't mean to mitigate that, but you always have to look at a concrete case. What is the state law? What can, there are two things that have to be evaluated here. And again, I don't mean to place up any smoking mirrors or anything. First thing is, could something be done morally? Now, objectively, I'd have to say this health and human services business, there probably is a way to justify cooperating with that morally. 
to say that the cooperation is distant enough that it passes the smell test. There's probably a way to do that. I'm not in favor of that myself. That doesn't mean there are no bishops in favor of that. But it might be morally justifiable to go along with that. However, we have staked a lot of our own credibility on this issue. And if we seem to pull back under pressure, the other issue is always giving scandal. Not meaning by that we shock other people. Giving scandal does not mean shocking somebody else in the first place. Giving scandal means leading another person into sin. Getting them more confused so that they're more likely to sin. And when a bishop makes a decision about the behavior of a Catholic hospital, he's got to ask first, could this at all be morally justified? And maybe it can. But if this is going to create a great deal of scandal, that is, lead many people into confusion and sin, then the bishop has to say no. <coughs> So sometimes when somebody says, well, this could be morally considerable, people jump at that, well, maybe it is morally considerable. The issue is scandal. And I think we've gone too far on this issue. I think if we're trying to come, my, this is my personal opinion, this is not the teaching of the church. I think if we try to uh, somehow cooperate with this. I think it's going to be seen as backing off the church's teaching on artificial contraception, which is what I believe started the down, downhill spiral to begin with. And I think sooner or later we've got to stand up on this issue. If not with religious freedom, then in due time. We've got to stand up on that issue because it's destroying the family unit. And once you destroy the family unit, you destroy democracy and you destroy the future. Okay. Excellency, uh, what do you say to those who would say that, uh, that this Catholic Church prior to Vatican II did not uh, preach uh, freedom of religion and that therefore uh, the Catholic Church's position on this has changed? Say that again, would you please? What do you say to those who, who claim that prior to Vatican II the Catholic Church teaching on freedom of religion was different, for instance, the syllabus of errors, and uh, therefore the Catholic Church has changed its teaching on this. I would say that that's not correct historically, because error, this Vatican I again, pre-Vatican II, error has no rights. That was always the teaching of the Church, and it still is the teaching of the Church. Error has no rights. If th something is false, no one has the right to proclaim what is false. Error has no rights. But if someone is sincerely in error, if a human being is sincerely in error, they do not lose their rights because of that error. That was the twist that Vatican II gave. So, error has no rights. Church always taught that. But the one who is in error retains his or her rights as long as they're sincere and in good faith. Okay? And I mean, even if they're in bad faith, they retain their right to life because in discussing this kind of a thing, the last thing we want to do is undermine the teaching on human dignity. So in order to uphold human dignity, we have to say error has no rights, but the one in error retains basic human rights just because he or she is human. So I'd say there really is no change, there's an addition. 
Speaking of scandal on the church, the last two Supreme Court decisions, one on Dome and one on Prop 8, were both authored by Catholics. And when will bishops or whomever who think should be doing this hold, speak out more forcefully against um, public officials who are Catholic, who are by their actions and word leading others astray? Um. I have done so, ask Raymond Arroyo. I don't, <laughs> don't know what to say, I have done so. But I think um, there's an issue here that people are not, and I'm, this doesn't speak directly to what you just asked, but it's very close. In order, say, to impose an excommunication on someone, that offense has to be explicitly listed in canon law as deserving excommunication. Nowhere in canon law does it say that a Catholic politician who is pro-choice and votes pro-choice is to be excommunicated. It doesn't say that. Maybe it should say that in canon law, but it doesn't say that. And since it doesn't say that, someone can't. Now, the proper thing is if someone does that, they are to be denied communion. And there's an awful lot of disagreement among bishops about that. And to be honest, I don't understand it. Because there's no confusion about it in canon law. It's very clear. Someone who does these things is to be denied Holy Communion. It doesn't say maybe. It doesn't say it's up to the bishop. It says if it can be verified that so-and-so has done such and such, if there's hard evidence for that, then that person is not to be admitted to communion. But that's, and that's not a penalty. That's a liturgical discipline. In other words, no one who's not properly disposed should receive communion. And that applies to these people. It's a liturgical disposition, it's not a penalty. And in canon law, it's not, that's not prescribed as a penalty, you punish someone. If you're gonna punish someone in the church, there's a very careful process that you have to go through. It's complicated. To be very honest, this is why sometimes bishops hesitate to punish. Because if they don't get all their I's dotted and all their T's crossed, they will be overturned. And many have been. So um, there's no question that the book of canon law on penalties, there's a whole book that was issued in 1983 is in severe need of revision. And even as I speak to you, Cardinal Burke is working hard revising it. <laughs> so that should give everybody hope. You're actually writing in online. Uh, Liz asked the question, what can I say to same-sex couples who are raising their children with much love and are attending churches that accept them as they are Many of them are ex-Catholics, and to them, Catholics seem to be nothing more than haters. What can she say to these type of people? Well, see, this is the sociological problem now. That if we try to teach that homosexual behavior is wrong, the response to that is you're a bigot. Now, there's not much we can do about that. I mean, again, that's the media joining in with the administration, painting certain people as bigots, moving toward painting them as violators of civil rights, moving toward putting them in jail and fining them. That's the game that's being played. So if someone is totally caught up in that game, there's not much it can do. But what I always do in that, I always do this, I say, you know, do you take Jesus Christ seriously? Have you met Jesus Christ risen from the dead? Do you want to? That's what I'm interested in. Because if somebody is really looking for Jesus, hardened hearts and minds open up. 
And instead of going on about the particular issue, <coughs> I, if I had my way, I'd have your children taken away from you tomorrow. Instead of saying that, I would say, where do you stand with Jesus? <laughs> do you know him? Do you know him in a personal way? Did you ever talk to him about this subject in a personal way? I said, no, I form my conscience. <laughs> and I follow my conscience. That's what, the, that's what this all goes back to. The worst misinterpretation of Vatican II was the one about conscience, because that opened the door to everything else. <coughs> Your Excellency, um, in the old days, um, only uh, special people like Descartes and Hume and Henry VIII thought they were constituting the world personally. Um, but now everybody does. Uh, there used to not be that trickle down, and now it's everybody. And um, besides the mass media, um, and uh, what, what else causes that? How, why, how has it become so widespread? Well, I mean, it goes back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve wanted to be like gods. If you're the creator of the world and you write the rules, you're like God. There's a kind of a human tendency in that direction. But it's not that they're only individuals. Uh, at the French Revolution, a lot of people got that idea and turned to violence over it. Because if everybody is composing his or her own world as they go along, there's got to be conflict. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you.